Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Desk.com, the all-in-one customer support app for fast-growing companies. Visit desk.com slash twist to get your service desk up and running for as low as $3 per month. And by New Relic. Visit newrelic.com slash twist and see why thousands of developers worldwide don't deploy without it. And by AWS Activate, it's easy to start and scale your business with Amazon Web Services. Check out free resources like one-on-one office hours with AWS Solutions Architects and much more. Learn more and sign up at aws.amazon.com slash activate. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Kalkanis, and this is, of course, This Week in Startups. Uh, first, your cell phone. You're used to having to buy a new one every few years. And Paul from Motorola's project, Aura, was on... Um, the program at the launch festival, and he showed this incredible transformer of a phone where you could just take pieces of your phone apart and put it back together. It was amazing. Modular cell phones. It looks like these things are going to actually happen. So uh, we're pretty excited about it. And um, he, uh, they may have sold Motorola, but actually he's staying at Google to do this very project. And um, hey, segueing from your phone to your wheels, we also had Automatic uh, at the launch festival, another incredible piece of hardware technology. You plug it into the port of your car, and it gives you all this amazing data on what going on with your car on your mobile phone. Yeah, two amazing, amazing pieces of technology, um, one for your phone, one for your car, that are going to change the way we experience day-to-day life and, and how do we travel and how do we communicate. Two very important topics today on This Week in Startups. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil, but funny how it feeds my people, yeah. we ain't gonna live like you. Until we get the money, spend the money and defeat you yeah. Money is the root of all evil what? Funny how it feeds my people yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals Until we get the money, spend the money and defeat you Hey Paul, how are you? Good. Nice to see you again Nice to see you as well, thanks where's for your, having where's, me Where's your little kit? It's in my pocket. It's all in your pocket. Yeah, okay. as cell phones should be, right? Absolutely. Let's go to the Elmo here. I think we're okay. going to... I think they were going to do an Oh, we're going to do it over there? Okay. But, uh, Let's do it over there. You, whatever no, over you, here is better. Whatever, whatever you prefer. Now, you work at the Google. I do. Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, for about a week now. Uh, <laughs> oh, right, because you were at Motorola. That's right. That's right. Um, let's get this out of the way. Okay, so you're showing me what... So I'm showing you an industri- a high-fidelity industrial design prototype, right? So this is, this is non-functional. I'll show you some pieces of, uh, of functionality in a second here. Sure. Um, and so this is the Project Aura phone, uh, to, hopefully to be known as the Google Aura in, uh, uh, in, in the, coming, uh, in the year, year to come or so. Um, so the device is modular. Um, there's both front-facing modularity. Um, let me just remove the display here, uh, as well as... Uh, rear-facing modularity. So you're taking your phone apart right now. That's exactly what I'm doing. That's exactly what I'm doing. And uh, our goal here is to create basically a third-party ecosystem of module developers, is to change the way innovation happens in the hardware space and make it a lot more like the software and app store model. Or transformers. <laughs> or transformers. As it were. That's right. So, so uh, when these come sliding out, just so people know, yeah. there's a little bit of a magnetic, which actually you can see the play on it there. Yeah. That's right. It's a little, it's like actually kind of a, feels nice. Yeah. It's a nice hand feel. Reminds me of the uh, cookie dough from before. Yeah. So, um, so if I could explain that for a second. Yeah. That's a, so that's a, about a three Newton permanent magnet. Uh, and three that's Newton. Three Newton. So very weak, right? Yeah. It's just enough for you to put the modules in and be able to flip the device over without, uh, without the modules uh, falling out. Um, the functional prototype, uh, which if you could click uh, to the next slide, is it? Oh, I guess oh. the slides go away. Uh, yeah, the slides go away. Okay. When we do I have this. a picture of Here the functional go. prototype. Here we go. Uh, and if you could click to the next slide, uh, or somebody could click to Here the next go. slide. There we go. Click? There we go. Yep. So that's the functional prototype. First functional prototype that's under development. Uh, I, it was supposed to boot for this demo. Oh, really? Uh, it doesn't quite boot. Uh, <laughs> so I brought I brought a module from the functional prototype, so I can oh. show you show you sort of a functional module. I'll get to those in a second. Uh, so this is a real, real Aura module. It's a Wi-Fi module. Okay, so we're back um, to the camera. Yeah, Got yeah it. so we're back to the camera here. Uh, and uh, let me remove the enclosure. The enclosures are user serviceable. User serviceable in... Meaning that a user can remove the enclosure. Got it. Uh, and swap it out for a different one. Because not only are we after functional customization here, but we're after aesthetic customization as well. Ah, so Prada could make, or 
whatever, Hermes could make their own cases. So you could absolutely do that. What, um, are 3D I think, printed? Uh, th these are 3D printed. Uh, oh, these are 3D printed. This is a 3D printed one. Ah, okay. uh, here are some other examples of 3D printed ones. Um, we have a, a, a big relationship with 3D Systems on this. Uh, it's our, uh, our partner in this program. And 3D Systems is actually developing the first uh, production volume consumer grade uh, 3D printer. Uh -huh. And we're also experimenting with printing functional materials like conductive inks ah. to be able to do custom antennas. And uh, I think I have an antenna oh, here. Wow. So going so from cosmetic 3D printing to also functional. That's right. Wow. And okay. so that's an example. This is not 3D printed, but this is designed for 3D printing, right? So this is made using traditional uh, printed circuit board manufacturing methods. And this is the antenna that's in the Wi-Fi module, but it's glued in uh, uh, here. Uh, this, so this is the, the bare so antenna. So just step back a second. This frame yep. is a battery and what else? Because it's incredibly so light. There, there is a battery in the frame. Obviously, okay. this is a, an appearance model. But yeah. there, in, the, in the functional prototype, there is a battery in the frame. That battery is very, very small. The purpose for that battery is to act as reserve so that you can hot swap uh, the modules. And inc that includes the battery modules. And so this module could be a battery. It could easily be a battery. The uh, two by two. A two by two, that's two right. Two battery. Or I could do a one by two battery. Or you could do a one by two or a one by one, although that wouldn't be very much battery capacity. Maybe a small um, battery. Any module can be a uh, power source, power sink, or a power storage device. Uh -huh. Uh, or anything else for that matter, right? So the modules, the only thing that we constrain is this partitioning scheme, what we call the one by one, one by two, two by two. Got it. And we provide uh, our, uh, to the developer community uh, the module developer's kit, which is basically an open platform specification uh, that a lot, and a reference implementation that allows anybody to create their own modules for this platform. And that, and that MDK is free and open. Um, we'll publish it probably in a, in a little over a month. So uh, if Eve Bahar, who was on the stage yesterday, yep. says, I want to create a module yep. for a jam box, speaker-ish kind yep. of thing, he could make a one by one, two by two, one by two, or whatever this is called. That's right. The front-facing modules have a slightly different, different parceling scheme. Right. Or partition so scheme. you could basically have someone like Jawbone make their own speaker system for this, or Beats by Dre. Yep. And I could say, you know what, I'm going to a party. Mm -hmm. I want, to put th I want to put a subwoofer and four speakers back here and battery life, but I don't need the camera. That's right. That's exactly right. And uh, so you could even imagine uh, sharing modules uh, inside a family, right? Um, ah. I think that works better, perhaps, that's more appealing to, to perhaps lower end users who can't afford uh, sort of a high, a high definition camera, uh, uh -huh. but might be able to, do, to sort of pool, pool resources to do that. Um, we really set out to design uh, the platform for uh, 6 billion people. And that's 1 billion of existing smartphone users today and 5 billion feature phone users. Uh, and that's part, of Google's, uh, that's part of Google's objectives, right, is to bring the internet, and in our case, the mobile internet, to the next 5 billion. Ah, yes, New Relic. New Relic saved my life, and they saved the life of Nike, Warby Parker, Airbnb, Comcast, and AT&T every day. I know this because I went through it myself. We had tons of problems when Inside.com launched, and like any startup, we're trying to figure it out. We had a lot of pressure on us. And when we had New Relic on our systems, it was, as I've said before, like the hand of God just saying, like, here's all the things that could possibly be wrong, and just whoop, bing. Here is the exact problem you're having. This is why your database servers have too much load. This is the piece of code. Here's where to fix it. Bang, we go in like surgeons and fix it. But we needed to have that microscope. We needed to have that intelligence system to really figure out where we were having problems in our stack. And New Relic was that microscope. It was that laser that got us focused on the problem and resolved it. Go to newrelic.com slash twist, newrelic.com slash twist, and sign up to get a free This Week in Startup shirt. It's super fast, it's super easy, and no credit card is required. Uh, new from them is the New Relics Insights product where you can ask your software questions and get answers immediately. Example, how many people signed up for a free trial today? What is our revenue by geography? How many unique visitors completed our checkouts? Uh, for more, go to newrelic.com slash insights. This is a new product, newrelic.com slash insights. Um, again, super easy, super fast. No credit card required, and speed and stability are two of the most important things that any startup uh, can do to grow, and startups are about growth. That's why we exist. You need a partner like New Relic, and uh, it's great to have them as a partner on this program because it's like having your favorite flavor of ice cream sponsor your program. That's what New Relic is like. It's like, oh, I love coffee ice cream. Everybody knows I love coffee ice cream. And so, like, it's like, oh, 
t- Jason, here, here's a bowl of coffee ice cream. Talk about how much you love it. I love it. It makes me feel like I'm eating ice cream and vanilla vanilla ice cream and having a cup of coffee at the same time. And, and you know, but it's cold and I love it. It's just delicious. New York is delicious. It's like coffee ice cream. Okay. Or whatever ice cream is your favorite. Let's get back to this amazing program. So this seems like so super customizable and awesome. It would make me think that it would be more expensive to have this customization. Um, will it be more expensive at first, or do you have some strategy to make it cheaper? So well, why yeah, would this so, be cheaper to do something so extensible? Sure. So, so there's certainly some overhead to, to modularity. There's no yeah. doubt about that. It's a network on device, right? Mm-hmm. So we're creating a packet switch network. There's overhead with the, the, the magnets uh, that hold the device, uh, the, the modules in, and the, and the network protocol. Um, and so all of those things absolutely do come with some cost. Uh, the countervailing factors are uh, the fact that the, uh, that the consumer gets to decide exactly and, uh, and only what functionality goes into the device, right? So if you don't use a camera, right, if you want a really inexpensive stripped-down phone, you can do that. In fact, you can get a Wi-Fi-only device. Um, and so we talk uh, frequently about what we call the gray phone, which is aesthetically gray to sort of invite, uh, invite expression on the part of the user. Uh, and it's a phone that contains just a display, uh, a low-end application processor uh, that still runs Android, of course, right. uh, a Wi-Fi module, and a battery. And we're targeting $50 a bill of materials cost for that device, which is the crossover point uh, between feature phones and smartphones. So there is a lot of uh, margin locked up in a Samsung or, you know, HTC or, um, yep. you know, Apple phone. Sure. And the reason they make so much money is because they're putting all these things together. Is this a move by Google to take out all the margin of the hardware business and just get everybody competing so ra- so rapidly on each individual piece that the cost of a smartphone essentially goes to zero or close to zero? Yeah, so I, I think we're less interested in people's margins than we are in the pace and level of innovation in the hardware ecosystem, right? Oh. So I think that there are plenty of opportunities to make money out of a, of a highly competitive ecosystem, but what we are after is getting the number of brains in that ecosystem uh, up into the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, comparable to app, Android app developers, but just at the hardware level. And we do that by lowering the barrier to participation and allowing component developers or people who have never participated in the smartphone industry before, right? So for instance, an acoustics company, right, that may not be a, a, a mobile component vendor today, uh, could now uh, basically have uh, the ability to market directly to, to the consumer and see if there is an interest in, in them entering the mobile space. So how much would they have to pay you to uh, license your technology to put Beats by Dre in here? So they don't have to pay us anything. Um, so Zero the module, dollars. That's right. It is, you can think of it logically as uh, a, an analog to Android, but at the hardware level. And so in the same way that Android is free and open source and available to anybody to, to download from the, from the Google website, the MDK, the Module Developers Kit, will be free and open as well. It's a highly disruptive concept. Uh, yeah, I hope so. I think so. Yeah, I mean, if people who are camera op, who make cameras don't have to pay a VIG to get into the iPhone or Apple or Samsung don't have the ability to say, hey, you have to do it on this terms yep. because we have so much distribution, mm-hmm. um, that could change everything. Yeah, I think, uh, I think this, this does have the potential to make the mobile, the, the smartphone industry a lot more exciting. How, um, how long before, yeah, what's that sort of general timeline? It, sure. You know, if we're here next year, would somebody in the audience have one of these? Uh, uh, yes, I think so. So that's, that's our goal. Um, Would that I, person be a developer or a consumer? No, so we're getting hardware in the hands of developers much sooner than that. Oh. Uh, and in fact, so this is the, the, the first public announcement of our first ARA developers conference. Uh-huh. It'll be April 15th and 16th. April 15th and 16th. Yep, it'll be uh, online, streamed online, and there'll be interactive Q&A capability for online okay. participants, and it'll also be at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View. Wow. Uh, people can go to projectara.com and apply, apply to attend. Just for Project Aria, not for any other Google stuff. That's right. This is a developers conference aimed specifically at the Aria MDK, walking uh-huh. through the module developers kit and getting people uh, jump started on, on the development process. Um, and, and actually, I don't know if it's possible to get the overhead camera back. I, yeah. I wanted let's to show the, the rest camera. of the functional module. Yeah, let's show the rest of the functional module here. Now, you um, were saying before, obviously, 3D printing cases like this. Yeah. Super, like that's a layup, and now you're starting to see, like, you know, oh, why would I want a 3D printer? Like, hey, I, I might very much want to print, you know, a new Knicks cover when Carmelo Anthony leaves the Knicks. I could get a new cover, um, you know, and, and take him off the back of my phone battery. Yep. Um, but wow, you're saying this 
uh, antenna could be printed in yep. a printer eventually. And it could be completely custom to the module developer, right? So, so what would be, so would that be um, I'm in a new country or I'm going to another country and they have different type of antennas where I need a stronger signal strength, I'm going to make a bigger antenna? Why would I need to print an antenna? Yeah, so, so you could imagine uh, a variety of, of, of reasons for doing that. Uh, the, the reasons that you cited, certainly trying to access a different, different carrier network uh, or whatnot. Uh, we're also pretty excited by the form factor that it, that it affords to the antennas, right? It's basically a layered, uh, layered deposition technology. Hmm. Um, and uh, uh, so if you don't mind, let me show the rest of, yeah, the, show of, this, the, yeah. of the functional module. So, so you have the, the user removable cover here. And so I've removed the cover. Uh, it happens to contain uh, the antenna for the prototype Wi-Fi module. Uh, then there is a safety shield uh, so, that, uh, so that people can't, uh, don't touch the raw, the raw printed circuit board. That would normally be soldered on. I have it removable here to show you the rest of the module. Uh, and then you have the, the printed circuit board uh, that contains the Wi-Fi chipset in this case, uh, and it contains the uh, interface hardware for the ARA on device network. Um, and it contains here their spring pins, uh, but in the, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, second prototype, uh, these will be capacitive pads. Uh, and that lets us maintain the sleek sort of pebble-like appearance to, to the modules. Um, and, uh, and then you have two magnets, and these are special magnets. So I mentioned that the magnets in here are just permanent magnets, about three newtons in force. These magnets are electro-permanent magnets. So an electro-permanent magnet is one that is uh, passive in both the on state and the off state, but requires a voltage kick to tra transition between the two states. And so when they're, when they're turned on, uh, the strength of the magnets goes up by about an order of magnitude, so to about 30 newtons, and that's more than you can exert with your finger to pry out the modules. Right. And, uh, and again, the purpose of the magnets is also uh, to, to sort of overcome this notion of the fact that a modular device has to be bulky and boxy and Lego-like, yeah. um, uh, and that it can be sleek and it can be sexy and, and the, the industrial design can be beautiful. So we went for this pebble-like appearance with no card edge connectors, uh, and we'll be getting rid of the spring pins that are in the first prototype uh, uh, just as soon as we can. And the, is the core innovation here this magnet, like ease of use technology? You wouldn't have made it if you didn't have that ability? Because having to snap these in and lock them with a little pin or something, or like one of those tiny switches that you have to try to catch with your nail or a pen, that would have made it really lame, right? I mean. <laughs> so I, I, I guess I, I wouldn't say that that's the only thing, right? But certainly getting the industrial design, uh, and that's why we tackle that first, right? Is because oh. getting that to a place where users can be excited by it, where they find this to be palatable and a device that they can love, is um, uh, uh, we thought was a long pull in the tent uh, for a modular device. And this could, may not ha we may not have been able to do that uh, 10 years ago, uh, for instance, or 20 years ago when things were bigger. Um, so the ability to get the modular overhead down to a manageable level, to under 25% or so, uh, is really the enabler. The, these um, connectors here mm -hmm. that transfer data. Yep, as well as power. As well as power. W what is this technology? In how fast is it? Because I assume that's yeah. a key part of this, um, a key part of the uh, enabling technology. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So we're using uh, a protocol stack uh, from MIPI, which is the Mobile Industry Consortium. So we intentionally chose not to create a proprietary standard here. Uh, so this is available to, to anybody who is a MIPI, MIPI member. Uh, it's called MFI at the physical layer, at layer one. Uh, and it's about, it offers about 10, mega, 10 gigabits, I apologize, per connector block. So the big modules could go up to 20 gigabits. Uh, the, the smaller modules that have a single connector block are, are 10 gigabits. And so that allows us quite a bit of margin to, um, uh, uh, for growth, right? So that the yeah. platform can be longer lived than the obsolescence timescales and the technology timescales of each individual component, which can be different, by the way. That's the other interesting thing, right? Is displays have a different obsolescence and technology maturation timeline than processors, than baseband. Uh, and cellular cameras, connectivity than cameras, and, and they batteries. can all evolve on their natural time scales rather than forcing you to throw away your phone every two years and buy a new one. Ah, uh, yes, desk.com, desk.com. I love desk.com because it gives me a 360 degree review of our customers in, their, in a universal inbox. And this is the key we have people, some might call them complainers, some might call them haters, some might call them our fans who are just disappointed. Consumers are vocal today, right? They're not passive. If they have a problem, no matter how minute it is, they are going to bring it up. And the more they love you, the more they're going to bring it up, and the deeper they're going to go, whether it's on Twitter or Facebook or emailing you or on you know, a review site, consumers are empowered. Let's just leave it at that. And they're coming at you from many different places. 
you need to have a system to organize this. And Salesforce uh, has desk.com. It works brilliantly. It's only $3 per month. Go to desk.com slash twist to sign up, desk.com slash twist. And uh, we use it to manage all the email uh, support for our conferences and this week in startups. And we can say like, hey, this issue is resolved, or here's a standard template to respond to that issue. So you don't have 10 different people with seven different ways of telling people pieces of information and they get conflicting reports. Oh, I called the support line. They said this. Oh, I emailed you. This person said this. Oh, producer Gina said that. Oh, Emily said that. We want to have, we want to have a united front. We want to have a, a clean, smooth support system. And that's why we use desk.com. You can use it everywhere on your desktop, on your tablet and on mobile. And uh, they have advanced analytics so you can learn from the customer support what your product should, how your product should change, right? And what features you should take in or put in or take out of your product. Um, and um, you can improve your agent productivity as well. If you have specifically, like if you have a high, you know, uh, a, ma a large number of customer support, you can improve the productivity of each agent uh, by routing feedback to your product management teams. We use it. It's great. Desk.com slash twist. Thank you for sponsoring the program and making a brilliant product that everybody loves so much. Let's get back to this amazing episode. Um, it seems like the screens get better every two years. 18 months? Yeah, that's probably about right. But like cellular connectivity goes from 3G to 4G to LTE uh, much slower than that, for instance. Right, that right? might be a four year, that's right. five year cycle. Exactly. And so you could just slide out your 4G connector or whatever it is, that's right. your antenna and yep. everything, and just start over. Yep. Absolutely. Um, and perhaps, uh, yeah, that's exactly right. Or keep your identity, right, on a single module and move oh, it Oh, that's an devices. interesting concept. So I take out my identity and say, here, take my phone for the day. That's right. You can use it. It's yep. all functional, but yep. none of my pictures are on it. Yep. Or move between phones or have a work phone. Oh. And a work, uh, the same I phone be a, a work phone and a home phone, but yeah. just with a swap of a... Or of if I wanted to go from a tablet to one with a keyboard, a BlackBerry-style device. Yeah, so you can do that, all right? So if you remove the, the, the front module, uh, there will be, uh, the only thing that's fixed is the location of these connector blocks. I guess I'm not showing this to yeah. anybody other than you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they can see it from um, uh, But uh, the, uh, uh, the other thing we're doing is there, uh, so these endoskeletons, we have a couple of them uh, mm. in the works. So here's a mini version. Oh, uh, this is beautiful. That, yeah, that has uh, uh, Yeah, this the, reminds me of, um, the old like Nokia's, like they had the small, thin. Yeah, everybody seems to be going towards bigger, and I'm not sure that bigger is better. Well, I mean, uh, and so here, here the consumer gets to choose again, right? Yeah, and this has these one by two, so if one of these were they're interchangeable. So right, I could take the camera and the I could just swap out the camera and my. Um, well, that's interesting. They magnet together. I could swap out yeah. the camera <laughs> and my memory chip and my SIM. Yep. And move it to my bigger phone and back. That's exactly right. And the endos, the endoskeletons, that's what yeah. we call the sort of the back plane here, uh, uh, we expect them to be fairly inexpensive. So they do very little other than just routing, routing data packets. It's a network switch. And so a these endos would be tens of dollars maybe or something. That's right. That's yeah, right. Not expensive. Yeah. We're um, targeting about 15 bucks for an endo. How many endos do you think you'll have? Because, and can the endos connect to another endo? So can I put <laughs> two of them together and make myself like literally a small tablet that had four screens or five screens? Yeah, so, so for starters, we're developing three different endos. Uh, we have the mini, the medium, uh, and we have a wide sort of phablet size that I don't have a model of here, uh, but it basically has a, one, of, one of the two, two, two by two modules or one by two modules on both sides of the spine. So you Very can imagine nice. it being uh, a third wider. Um, and in terms of connecting endos and creating sort of things that are no longer smartphone-y, um, I think there's a lot, I think the possibilities are actually limitless, um, mm -hmm. but one thing that I've been very keen to do with the program is to make a first, first and foremost a great smartphone rather than trying to focus on lots of different things and potentially ending up with something that's kind of mediocre at a lot of things. So I want it to be great at one thing and then right. look at the crossover points. And the only thing that Google owns in all of this is the endo core enabling technology, everything else is up for grabs, anybody can participate. That's right, anybody can participate. Uh, you know, certainly we want to, uh, uh, to maintain some control of the platform, right? Yeah. Uh, to ensure that there is a cohesion to the developer community, that it doesn't get fractured uh, as, as we start building it up. But we invite anybody to join the developer community. Are you scared that this thing is gonna crash constantly as people make, well, you know, people will go off the reservation and make all kinds of crazy stuff, you plug it in, your machine crashes, it freezes, and, and people just blame it on, you know, oh, the, the Google modular phone sucks because it crashes, and it really is the fact that, you know, somebody made a just poorly designed 
uh, module? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly a consideration. Uh, I think that, uh, so we intend to create a module marketplace uh -huh. uh, with a configurator app, you know, that allows you to do all of this customization and sort of manage the, the choice that consumers are faced with, uh, both functionally and aesthetically. Um, and that marketplace will have some certification and credentialing scheme associated yeah. with it. I think it'll be much more like the Google Play Store than the iTunes Store in terms of the level of invasiveness of that, of that certification yeah. and credentialing. So you, um, you will have to be certified to be in the store? That's right, to make but, it into the store. But, but you can sell modules outside the store and consumers it. in the same way that you can download an Android app outside of the Google Play Store. You just have to go change a setting in your configuration ah, and sort so of assume the say, risk. Yeah, um, I will allow my machine to crash. Uh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, and, and it's not going to be completely foolproof, right? I mean, I have apps that crash on my phone all the time. Yeah. Um, but we think we have enough safeguards being built into the platform from a thermal management perspective, from a power management perspective, that there's no safety hazard. I predict, and then if, uh, if a module is a bad module, right, then the phone will stop working, the user will take it out and know not, not, not to buy that module anymore. I'm predicting next year we're going to have a couple of companies on this stage who are launching module technology I hope so. as a startup. I yeah. mean, if this winds up getting some kind of adoption in the way Google has with, say, Chrome or Android, yep. my God, this could be an amazing ecosystem to build a startup on making phone, uh, you know, cameras. Cameras, or, or we think a particularly fruitful area is going to be personal medical diagnostics and devices for accessibility. Oh, wow. Um, we think that's pretty exciting, something that would never make it into a mainline device from a big OEM today. Ah, so a but screen for somebody who's specifically nearsighted or farsighted. Sure, or imagine uh, a spectrometer module that can do rapid analysis of fluids, right, or, or, or air or something like that, right, ah. for, uh, for diagnostics, environmental monitoring. So this starts to turn into uh, the tricorder or something. Uh, for instance, uh, and that's very personal, right? You seem right? like so, a Trekkie to me. Are you a Trekkie? <laughs> I, I, am, I am a space cadet, I admit yeah. it. Uh, I'm actually an aerospace engineer by, uh, by training. So you um, um, were in aerospace and you went for this project, why? I mean, uh, you could be working at SpaceX, right? You're something uh, like that. <laughs> um, I, uh, so I came to, uh, to Motorola and then now Google uh, from DARPA. Uh -huh. um, and the organization that, that Project R is being developed in is called ATAP, Advanced Technologies and Projects, so it's now Google ATAP. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have a, a pretty interesting premise, uh, which is to try the DARPA innovation model in the private sector. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is uh, a fairly short duration, very intense uh, focused projects that are at the intersection of fundamental, fundamental science and a driving moonshot type, uh, type practical application. Um, and we use external communities of performers. So there are actually three people at Google, uh, myself included, who work on this project. Oh. Uh, but there are hundreds of people, uh, around 100, probably a little north of 100, a uh, dozen, dozen or more performers uh, that are external. Uh, What's it like working. to work for Larry and Sergey? I mean, they, they must love you because this is like a great, crazy moonshot. Do they like say, hey, I'm coming by to visit you? Do they interact with you on a regular basis? Or is uh, it like, see me when you're done? Uh, so I, I am new to Google. Yeah. Uh, uh, I did have an opportunity to, uh, to brief Larry early on in, in my tenure, yeah. uh, uh, tenure at Motorola on the project. Yeah. Um, I, think it is, uh, I think it is very resonant with Google values in general, right? Yeah. And I think our objectives of, of uh, sort of uh, revolutionizing and democratizing the hardware ecosystem and reaching on the user-facing side, reaching the next five billion I think are pretty well aligned with. And they'll uh, just give you whatever resources you need for a project like this, right? Like, they're not stingy about like, hey, spend money and try to make this work. They're, it's just like, hey, go for it. So I guess I would phrase it this way. I think that, uh, that, that, ide that ideas are in shorter supply. So, so I think we're idea limited uh, rather, than, uh, rather than resource limited. Um, project Ara is going to be held on, the first webcast will be at what website? Where would we Project go? ARA.com. Oh, okay. And so that website went A -R -A live. Yeah. Com. Uh, ARA, right. Project yeah. ARA.com. And April 16th, you said? April 15th and 16th. So April 15th and 16th, they can go to projectara.com and watch and learn. Yep. And if they want to participate at the Computer History Museum, they got to just email you and get a... Yeah, so there's a registration page, both okay. for online and for in-person participation. Yeah. Uh, and we certainly welcome both. And, right. and also developers of all shapes and sizes, right? So from startups uh, uh, all the way to, to large, uh, uh, large OEMs, non-traditional participants in the smartphone industry, uh, you know, we really want to break it wide open. Awesome. Paul, this is amazing stuff, and congratulations on the progress. And uh, let's give a big round of applause for showing us the latest. <laughs> Car automation is getting big. We saw vehicle earlier, and um, one company is really making progress in this regard, and it's called Automatic. And Dijo is their CEO. Come on out, Dijo. 
uh, you are making cars smarter. Yeah. And how are you doing that? The way Automatic works is, you know, there's this little guy, and it connects to a standard port that every car sold since 1996 has. And it talks to your smartphone over Bluetooth, and your phone is connected to the internet, and that now allows us to connect to the computer of your car and do lots of cool stuff. And right? this port on the car is called the OD something? OBD2 port. It's the onboard OB, diagnostics port. Yeah. Onboard diagnostics yep. port. ODB P. And the, what is it called? The onboard diagnostics port. This is the OBD second version of the standard, so it's called OBD2 port. OBD2 port. And so when did cars uh, require this port? 1996, model year and later. Okay, so everybody's car has this, basically, yeah. unless you're driving a real old junker, in which case you probably don't need this. Um, now, does this, this is a very affordable device. How much does this cost today? You can go walk into an Apple store and buy it for $100. $100. Yep. Now, it doesn't have 3G or GPS, or does it? It does not. So it talks to your smartphone, it connects to your ah. smartphone over Bluetooth, and so it uses a lot of the capabilities of your smartphone, and that's how you can make it pretty low cost. So if I loan my car to somebody, mm -hmm. I don't know where it is necessarily because their phone is not connected to it. Yeah. So it does have a limitation there. In that sense, yes. Okay, so let's take a look at what the software looks like once you put this in here. And, and what is the target market for this? So right now, you know, the kinds of people who are buying the product are the average consumer, right? And so that was part of our goal when we were designing the product because the port has been around for 18 years, right? And so, you know, we have, yeah. there are lots of other devices like this one, but there has never been a product which okay. actually works for the average driver, and that's what Automatic does. Okay, so let's pull up um, the sure. iPhone on the stage, please, and we'll show that. Can we pull up the iPhone on the stage? It's port number five, I think. We don't need the over the shoulder, I don't think, because we're going to directly plug in. Um, Are we on? Not yet. I don't think so, unless it's on a different screen. Hey, guys, can we put the screen on here on the stage for automatic? Brandis? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? OK, so $99. You got yourself into the App Store while they're getting that figured out. Um, how does one? How long has it been in the Apple Store, by the way? We launched uh, last October. Last October, this yeah. past October. Yeah, about three months ago, three or four months ago. Yeah. OK. And how does one get into the Apple Store? I know that's a long process. How does that work as an entrepreneur? It was interesting because you know, I started talking to them the moment we had a good story to tell, right? And it was, uh, you know. Talking to Apple. Yeah, talking to the buyers of the Apple Store. Ah, and, so you uh, connect with the buyers of the Apple Store. Yeah. They're so, pretty discerning. They are very discerning, and uh, you know they have standards that they expect everybody to meet you know, if they're going to sell your product in the Apple Store. And uh, what are those standards? In the sense that you know Apple sets certain standards for their own products, and at least my interpretation of the way they do things is, if you bring the same level of uh, you know care and concern for the product and the user experience that's the single most important thing so so try to make it as close to an apple experience as possible if you want to be in the apple store it makes kind of sense yeah exactly okay so hey can we try to get this up one more time and can somebody tell me what's going on or if i should give up should i give up brandis or should i move to the elmo okay here we go perfect yeah, thank on. you okay so awesome. you know the way automatic works is and what does it do you know, you, it gives you a lot of feedback on how I actually use my car. This is actually my data. And one of the interesting things about our cars is that we spend you know, eight to $10,000 a year on our car, and we have pretty much no insight into how we use it and how we spend money on our cars. And so one of the things Automatic does is it gives you feedback about how you actually use your car. This at the top end of the uh, screen, you see that I drove about 350 miles last week, and I spent about 60 odd dollars. I spent 10 hours in my car. And we also give you a score, which is de you know, depends on how you actually drive. Because the small changes in your style of driving can help you save up to a third of the amount of money you spend on gas. And when you spend $3,000 a year, that's a lot of money. And you can also get you know, details about how you're actually using your car. You know, this trip, I drove for about 22 miles, and I spent $5. And if I tap on it, you will get more information about where was I driving. And you know, as you are driving, the device also gives you gentle feedback on the little things that you could be doing, which 
has an impact on fuel efficiency, right? Heart braking, acceleration, and things like that. And uh, so that is how we give people insight on their own uh, driving behavior. And yeah, so is that the number one reason people will buy it is to be better at getting gas mileage, or do they just want to obsess about their car? I'm trying to think of like what is the real killer app here. Have you found the killer app for it yet? Or so, you know, the way we look at it is that one, we are kind of laying out the foundation for the connected car and services platform, right? right. And as a startup, you don't uh, you know go in and build everything. So right now, we think we have a good story to tell, and we have launched that product. And there is obviously a lot more that we are building on top of this. And as of now, what's really working out well for us and the feedback that we're getting from our users is this is insight that they never had. In addition to that, you know, we also do things like, hey, we tell you where your car is parked all the time, right? And so uh -huh. this is where the car is parked right now, you know, walking directions back to that car. And this is simple. Your smartphone should know where your car is, right? And, right. But it doesn't today. And you know, even interesting things like, if my check engine light comes on in my car, like, what does that even mean? You know, we can tell you, here's why it's on. And what is the solution to that? Why did it come on? If it's something as stupid as your gas cap being loose, one tap in your smartphone and you can just clear it, right? And so there are a number of things like that. And the most important one, of course, that resonates with a lot of people is crash alert, because you know, this is without a monthly fee or any complicated uh, you know, setup. Oh, which is the OnStar feature. Exactly, right? And so there is a crash alert, and uh, we can detect that crash. There is a call center in the back end, and we will call into the car and stay with the user and contact their emergency contacts. And so all of that happens for you know, 100 bucks. And so that is really compelling to a lot of people. Um, most uh, people would prefer, I think, if it had like maybe a 3G connection in it, so mm -hmm. if my phone battery dies, I can connect to it. I know my Tesla has 3G built into the computer, uh, into the dashboard, and you can sort of find your car even when your phone's not in the car. Is that the next version, do you think? So, you know, I don't want to pre-announce anything yeah. right now, but the way we have always approached it is that how do we make it as affordable as possible, right? Ah. And this is something that historically when you want to add connectivity to cars and you have like a $30, $40 subscription fee, it's generally not worked out. You know, uh, even major companies like Ford take the strategy where, hey, you bring your own connectivity, right? And yeah. so that, you know, and that, that we feel is the right approach. And, and so that's it, what we are working towards. You know, um, Amazon did that WhisperNet, I think, kind yep. of deal on uh, the books and stuff like that. Can't you do like um, a $5 a year, like very low utilization data, or is that too hard to do now? It's not too hard to do. Yeah. And that is a great idea, yes. OK, great. So that's coming soon. Um, you had some I did not say that. I know, I did. Uh, we have some statistics. Uh, maybe you had some statistics. Yeah, so can we move on to the next slide? Yeah, let's please. go to the slides for a second. OK, here yeah. we go. So you know, one other thing we are doing with all of the data that we see from our users is we get to see an enormous amount of data that is coming in from cars and how do people actually drive. And this is analysis that our data scientists are doing. And what you're seeing on screen right here is uh, information about how are cars actually performing on the roads. Right? This is kind of hundreds of thousands of miles of actual driving data. And this is the kind of data that we are already you know, exposing on our blog. You can go read about it. And you will see that most cars are, you know, most fuel efficient at about 50, 55 miles an hour, and then they you know, dramatically stop, start dropping uh, after that. And uh, this is the kind of really good insight that we have about how people drive. And we're going to be able to personalize it and give every you know, user of automatic that information for their car. And we're also doing some fun stuff, like uh, you know, if you ask the question, how do, you know, how do you kind of uh, bust some myths around driving or maybe even confirm some myths around uh, driving and driving behavior and the stereotypes uh, around that? So if you ask the question, you know, how do luxury car drivers drive their cars? You know, are sure. they aggressive drivers? Are they bad drivers? And you know, if you consider different types of luxury cars, how do they drive? You know, this is Audi A4 drivers. What this you know, graphic actually shows you is the line in the middle is uh, the, the heat map, the, the taller the graphic around the line in the middle, the harder they are accelerating and braking, right? And so, uh -huh. so that is what this shows for Audi A4 drivers. But if you look at it for uh, BMW drivers, <laughs> you will see that you know, they actually do that a lot more. And they're really slamming on the gas and brakes. And so this is uh, data for, again, hundreds of thousands of miles of driving across you know, different uh, And drivers. this is an actual? This is the this is the truth. This is not 
No, this is data from actual automatic users, right? And of course, we are very paranoid about user privacy and all that. This is just aggregate data across different uh, users, but it allows us to see patterns that simply weren't uh, available before. And you know, this is a kind of interesting work uh, that we're doing right now and will slowly be exposed to all of our users. So you can start to figure out who is a good or a bad driver from this kind of data? We absolutely can. And so the way we think about it is at the end of the day, that is data and information for the user. And we just hold up a mirror and they get to decide what to do with that information. Do you think there will be a come a time, and it, we're already seeing this with some uh, insurance policies about the amount of miles you're going. Mm -hmm. but do you think there's a time where my insurance would be tied to something like this? I mean, that is the big fear and opportunity. Yeah. Obviously, BMW drivers have no interest in sharing this and having their insurance go up, but the Audi driver might be very interested exactly. in lowering their insurance and saying, look, I don't slam on my brakes, I don't speed, you can have all my data, just give me a lower rate. Yeah, and that is already happening in the insurance industry. It's called usage-based insurance, and people might be familiar with ads on TV that various insurance companies are starting to do that, but the problem with those models is exactly what you described, is you don't want to take a device from your insurance company and have them own all of your data, and mm -hmm. the benefit of uh, this whole system is that at the end of the day, you control it, right? If you want to share it, you can share it. If you don't want to, you, you know, it's up to you. It's usage-based now, though, which is just how many miles I go. My insurance is based on how many miles I drive. And that's starting. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's not popular yet. It's, right. it's not the mass market. But that is the direction in which that industry is moving. When will you think style of driving you know, starts impacting insurance? Five so, years from now, 10 years from now? It has already started, right? And really? So, yeah. Th and there are people tracking speed? So when you, you can sign up with uh, some insurance companies for specific products, mm -hmm. which will you know, collect data about your style of driving, and they will charge you accordingly. Are they, are they popular yet, those ones, the style Not of driving? Not very popular, and part of the problem is that, right? There yeah. are privacy concerns, and nobody wants their insurance company, companies to own that data. And the challenge is, how do you get you know, the user to control that and be in the center of all of that. And so that's how we think about it. It shouldn't be anybody has, else but you. Has anybody had data from one of your devices or a similar device um, basically subpoenaed or, you know, requested from law enforcement after an accident or during a lawsuit? No, that hasn't really happened to us so far. Has it happened to you? No. Does that happen in the marketplace where people say, hey, we know you have a black box in there. We want that data because we want to sue you or you could be at fault or you're not at fault? Yeah, and that's definitely a risk. And uh, because that is a pretty serious issue, a law is making its way through uh, Congress right now, which basically says, hey, any data related to your car, the consumer owns it, right? And it starts from there, and they get to decide what happens to that data. And so it's being regulated. And I think over the next few years, that will absolutely happen. Do you think, though, our data, you know, we can own the data, but a judge could say, hey, listen, we think you're at fault. We're going to get that data from you and force you to give it. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you think is going to happen there? So, Which, do you think it should happen? Do you think it will be better for society if all of our data is actually subpoenaable, no. discoverable, or do you think it'd be, because it could make everybody a safer driver? Probably, and you know, that is, yeah, the general trend towards which once you start connecting all of these devices, there are 200 million non-commercial passenger cars on the road in the US, right? And that is a whole lot of vehicles. These are the most expensive computers we own. They've never been connected. And so a lot of these questions are going to become very important as this huge part of the economy suddenly comes online and gets connected. Yeah. And there aren't easy answers. We have struggled with those questions in other aspects you know, of uh, technology as they get connected up. And we're going to struggle with those same questions in this aspect too. And we'll see how that goes. Great. You but agree. anyway, so going forward, you know, the other thing that we're trying to do with Automatic is the fundamental goal is to connect that expensive computer we own and yeah. make the ownership experience better. And is there another slide, by the way? Uh, not really, no. No, OK. So great. there is no slide here. Okay. So I'm just going to go to the next slide. And so what we're doing uh, next and taking that one step further, and today we are announcing uh, that we are integrating. How do you make your car a node in the larger internet of things of our life? Right? How do you make it talk to all of the other services that we are really familiar with? And uh, that's what we are enabling today. We are announcing that uh, we are yeah, you know, going to be a channel on if this, then that. If you guys might all be familiar with that. And uh, what if does is it's a service which makes it very easy for 
any service to talk to any other service without uh, you having to write any code or program it. So you have an example of how Absolutely. this might work? Yeah. And so some of the things that you can do with it are, you know, you can text your significant other when you leave work automatically. The moment you switch on your ignition, boom, the you know, text message goes out. The moment you go home and park your car, you can turn on the lights because it's connected in the back end. Your car is now talking to the Philips Hue light bulb or your smart home uh, hub or something like that. You know, when your check engine light comes on in, in the car, you can set it up so that your mechanic gets all of the details of what is wrong with your car and your phone number and all of that just goes to him immediately and he takes care of it. So there's lots more that can be done. You know, and we have a number of recipes that have already been uh, you know, set up and created on IFT. And all of you should definitely go and uh, play with it and create more of your own, depending on all of the services that are uh, <laughs> on IFT. And uh, so you know, what we also thought we should do is just to make it you know, attractive to all of you, we have created a code called uh, Launch. You can just go and uh, order it and play with it and you know, set it up and uh, let us know what you think. And you're going to get 25% off if you just, and this is for the launch audience. So uh, that's very generous. Thank you, everybody. Check it out. Now, in the f so these if-then-else statements, they are um, pretty basic right now. This is the 1.0 that you're launching today of it. And people might be able to trigger alerts when they are coming or going and all that kind of stuff. That's great. Are you um, going to be able to communicate between cars at some point? And Absolutely. And yeah. so you know, the next step for us in that direction is uh, what we announced two or three weeks ago was every automatic device is now an iBeacon, right? And uh, so an iBeacon. It's an iBeacon. Right. So that's uh, a technology that Apple uh, announced. And so connectivity is not just about you know, connecting your car to the cloud. It's also how do you make it talk to the other uh, you know, devices in the real world, right? And so what can that uh, enable? Things like you just drive into a parking lot, and the gate opens. You park, and you walk away. And the gate knows that your car is you and it has an identity. And once you go near, it's able to charge you. And it, same with fuel payments. Or there are all you know, sorts of applications where your car having an identity and making it proximity-based will allow you to improve the experience in all kinds of different ways. So you don't ways. need the security guard there. It just opens when I'm there. And if yeah. not, you get a ticket um, to take to pay. And so is there another slide? Or Yeah. And yeah, finally, we were, you were talking about how cars could possibly talk to each other, right? And so yeah. that's an interesting uh, development that's happening uh, you know, over the last decade, actually. But right now, this is something that is becoming more and more important. The federal government recently came out and said they're going to mandate that all the cars have to talk to each other starting in uh, a few years. And that will make a lot of uh, you know, things that are a problem today, safety, for example. And it's, it's kind of the analysis is that once cars start talking to each other, about accidents are going to go down by about 80% or something like that, right? And so this is something that's happening now. And what is that technology called? Because I know that exists in planes. Yeah. Planes have beacons that tell them if another plane's in the area, and every plane has to have that. Yep. So what is this technology called that's coming? Because obviously it's not based on this port, it's based on them talking to each other. It is. So it's called uh, V2V, vehicle-to-vehicle communication, and it's based on uh, you know, a technology called dedicated short-range communications. Dedicated short-range communications. Yeah, it's called DSRC, and uh, so it is a Wi-Fi-based standard. Right. Wi-Fi. So it's, it's at the same frequencies, and it's, yeah. it's similar to that. And so it has a range of about 1,000 feet. And so anybody who was in a, in a range of about 1,000 feet from you, it could either be another car, or it could be you know, roadside uh, nodes, which you're also talking to. And so that, that's what makes the entire system more intelligent, right? And you, you know where other cars are. If it's a blind intersection and two cars are coming close to each other, they warn each other and maybe even slow down. And so that's what brings about the uh, safety benefits. And, and if we have those in our cars, would we have intelligent intersections? Or Absolutely. Is that so the way, at least that's the goal. You know, there are a lot of hurdles to get there. But some of the things that you can enable is, you know, the moment a, an ambulance comes onto the road, right? it gets green all the way through because the ambulance is now talking to the nodes along the road and saying, I get priority, and you, know, you can enable things like that. And how far before you think this sort of vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication standard um, sort of hits the road? As with all things automotive, that's the 
interesting question, right? You know, they have huge, long uh, product cycles, and I think it's unlikely to happen in the next decade. And this is the classic chicken and egg kind of uh, problem where it only becomes interesting once a critical mass of cars on the road actually have that. And, uh, and that's why you know, federal regulations are uh, happening, because otherwise nobody has an incentive to actually build them into the cars. But and so that's what's happening now. They could be added to existing cars, right? They, they could, could be. They could be retrofitted, but the only yeah. question is who's going to pay for it. And what is the consumer benefit today if nobody else has it, right? And what would the retrofit, you think, for a device like that cost? You think it would be a $50, $100 device? Probably, yeah. So, they, I mean, if we get to a tipping point where a third of the cars on the road have it yeah. because they're new, we could just, you no, know. But that's the thing. To get to a third of the cars in new cars, that's going to take 15 years. Right? 15 years? Yeah, it's going to take 10 to 15 years. Yeah, wow. So it's, it's hard to actually make this happen. Well, this is an incredible uh, view of the future of driving, and I uh, really appreciate you sharing with us. Thank you. Well done. Thanks for your time.